Hello, I'm Robin and welcome to the March edition of Molten Music Monthly. Well, this is my first monthly since I parted company with Gear News and it's slightly weird because I'm no longer immersed in news. No longer immersed. No longer have my finger on that pulse of exactly what's going on and so it's been quite fascinating today as I've been looking into what it is on earth I'm going to talk about. Because I don't have a natural stream of things that I've already written about in order to tell you about. And so I've had to look into it myself, do a bit of research, read around, watch some videos. And that's given me an opportunity to cast a fresh eye upon what it is that I bring to these little monthly meetings that we have. And so perhaps it's given me an opportunity to be more discerning, maybe, to pick out the real peaches, the real fascinating stuff from the month, as opposed to just droning on about whatever it is that's come along. So is that good? Is that exciting? I have no idea. But hey, let's have a look to see what we have. Octone reworks Qubit into Instruo. Cosmo introduces the Crossphobe Morbulator. Synth Cube picks up Mod Wiggler. Bufaco has octaves, ponies, and MIDI. DivKid sorts out your outputs. Von Gon comes up with a synthesizer. Aojo Instruments has a go at MPE control. Noise Engineering gets RP. Pittsburgh turns Tiger into a real synth. Body Synths has a glitch machine for metal fetishists. Forever 89 has a drum blob. Roland has a piano with everything. Busy Circuits gets into Casio. Ableton releases Push 3 and Live 12. AM Synths has a bunch of System 100 modules for us to have a look at. And we have a bunch of new modules from Omnitone and Ear Modular. I know, I've not heard of them either. So that's an exciting introduction to some new stuff that we've never seen before. But first, our good friends Gaz Williams and Steve Davis have got together to create something new. It's called Rack Records. And it's a record label with the intention of bringing together conversations about modular synthesis. It's designed to foster an environment of creativity where modular people come together and collaborate. It will draw off those live energies that are generated when two competing racks bash together into some kind of creative explosion of modular control voltage patching and wibbly wobbly musical sound. <laughs> it's a fantastic endeavour. I'm so pleased that they're putting this together. It's it's going to be amazing. Simple name, Rack. You're going to remember it. It's like, it's like Euro Rack and it's like Rack in Snooker. You know, it brings together those kinds of those kinds of, of concepts of ideas of this clashing between cultures of, of Gaz Williams, ultimate musician and thought, a thought modular expert. And Steve Davis, this uh, is this throwaway <laughs> international champion who's come crashing into the party of, of bleeps and bloops and sounds and music and is is just extraordinary. And as it happens, I, this just turned up in the mail as well. The Utopia Strong, which is Steve Davis's little outfit he does with Cavis and that other guy who I can never remember. Michael York. <laughs> That's right. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> Which is amazing. And I mean, the music that they're putting together, the music that they come up with is just extraordinary. And for Steve, it is all about that collaboration, that process, that that pushing of waveforms and sound and thoughts between people. It's not a singular personal pursuit. Oh, of course it can be. Of course it can be. But modular is perhaps arguably at its best when it is drawn out of different people through that chance collaboration. It really is, it's extraordinary. I mean, I know very well through uh, what we've done at Synth East, where we've had these patch offs, we get two people together, two modular artists and go one, two, three, go and off you go. And you just make music. It's fantastic, it's phenomenal. It's messy, it's raw, it's accidental and unintentional, while at the same time, you're trying to drive through an idea because you might have come with one and yet that's being modulated and messed about with by this other person. It's just a superb way to make music. And so this whole Rack Records record label is designed to capture that. 
to have a, the least amount of computerized input as possible, as in it will be sort of mastered ultimately for distribution through a computer, but that is going to be its only influence, I think. And also editing as well. They just want to capture the performance and really minimize any kind of topping or tailing or editing or chopping or correcting. It's just going to be kind of how it is. Anyway, Rack Records is launching on the 4th of April in Bristol and there are tickets available. You can go and buy a ticket and come along. And what's happening that night? Well, a whole bunch of people are getting together to do a modular kind of, what would you call it? A handoff tag team? <laughs> around robin not sure but rather than like with the patch offs we do at synth east where you have two people and they play and they do their thing and then you have another two people do theirs this is a continuing a continuing collaboration so you start off with one person one person modulating modular creating music then another person comes into that and blends in and then that first person drops away and another person joins in so you have this continual movement through all of the artists I think. I think that's how it's going to work. I don't know. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be contributing to this <laughs> this exciting, spontaneous, improvised craziness. So I'm going to have to come up with a with a thing in like a week. I don't know. I'll come up with something. No doubt. I always manage to. So I will. I will. I promise. I'll come up with something. <laughs> so... Uh, so that'll be fun. So go along to rackrecords.com. You will find, I think, uh, the place there where you can buy tickets. It's in Bristol. It's a Thursday night, April the 4th. So next week or so, I think it is. And it'll be great. It'll be a fun, fun time. And we'll all be there having having it large, lagering and making modular music, I imagine. And in some other news, before we get to talking about all the gear, my mate Jeff from guitarbomb.com has a guitar to give away. All you've got to do is sign up, Facebook, like, social media, all that kind of thing. He's just trying to gather a bigger audience for his awesome guitar focus blog and news site. And you can win a Court G250 SE. So head over there, sign up, get yourself down to win a fabulous guitar in awesome olive green. I'd say it does look rather nice. Hmm. Right, on with the show. Glasgow Synth Guild. Now, I hadn't heard of them either, I don't suppose, but they seem to be an outworking or an outpouring or a projection into some kind of reality of people from, I think, Instruo. I mean, Instruo, we know, you know, run by Jason Lim, is an extraordinary outfit of creative and deeply artistic Eurorack modules. Fantastic. Love all their stuff. Don't have anywhere near enough of it. In fact, I've only got a couple of pieces, I think. I need to sort that out. But extraordinary bits of modular come out of that. Now, I'm not completely privy to the entire story of what this is all about, but as I understand it, the Octone was a Qubit module. And I think, if I've got this right, people can correct me in the in the comments, that, that Jason from Instruo was at one time a designer for Qubit and designed this rotational sequencer. Uh, which they released many, many moons ago and has since been discontinued, I think. So taking this design, I believe, the Glasgow Synth Guild has reworked it and re-jigged it a little bit and it's emerged into the world as the Octone. Of course, there's some kind of accent on the O as if to make it uh, say something different, but I'm just going to go with Octone. And I have one of those. Here, yeah, I bought it myself. I thought that was fascinating. I like a good eight note sequencer and that's kind of what it is. And in fact, it can be 16 notes if you buy two, but you know, it's not, it's not the cheapest thing in the world. But it's super simple and super hands-on in that you've just got a circle, a stretched circle of eight buttons and eight notes and eight things. You can dial in um, scales. It's got scales and quantization built in, which is just fabulous and so you can dial in a scale dial in a bunch of notes and off it goes you can take the notes in take the notes out it's very easy to follow you know exactly what's going on round it goes kicking out its gates kicking out its notes you can send it off in different directions or randomize it it's simple it's straightforward it's immediate it's the sort of thing you can drop into a live set and just dial in a bunch of stuff dial down a bunch of stuff make it do its thing it's clockable and unclockable it doesn't have to be quantized it is there firmly and safely generating both uh, gates and 
notes quantized or unquantized beautifully within the context of what you're doing. I found it to be totally lovely and refreshing. As I say, I like a good eight step sequence. I just want eight steps just to put in very simply. I've got that great one from Wave Phonics which I've used a huge amount. But this one is sitting really nicely I have to say in my case at the moment and it's just creating beautiful things and it does it and then you you craft another beautiful thing and then you craft another beautiful thing and that's I think what's awesome about a small simple relatively unfussy sequencer is that you can just write a bunch of notes and off you go that's I mean what what else could you possibly need it also does some interesting things with pulse counts in how it gets to trigger each step uh, a certain number of times, a bit like the M185, which is another favorite sequencer of mine. And you can also use it to actually play individual notes. And each step also has an individual gate output, which is very useful for all sorts of interesting things to set something off or to, to trigger an envelope over there. Or so every only on every cycle do you have one envelope fire or something else like that. It gives you a lot of interesting creative possibilities. So it's a fine bit of work that I think I'm going to be doing some videos on very, very soon. Sam from Look Mum No Computer has introduced another weirdo Cosmo thing, which uh, I just adore. I adore the whole Cosmo format. What is it? Well, it's a it's Eurorack, but in a larger, funkier form. Like this. No, it's not that way up. It's actually this way up. It's kind of five U, so if you compare it to... Uh, to to regular Euro rack, like so. See regular Euro rack? It's like two you bigger, right? So it's proper like Moog modular size modules, but using everything that Euro rack's all about. So it's it's simple, it's compatible, it will run with everything, it's the right voltage, it's the right power supply, you've just got a whacking great big front panel. So <laughs> what I really liked about this is that it's a synthesizer voice. So you've got two oscillators, you've got a filter, You've got a mixer, envelopes. It's an entire voice in a single front panel kind of thing that you have to build a case for. Now, they sell these just as panel and, uh, and PCB sets like this, beautifully made, beautifully inscribed. And then it's up to you to source the parts and put the thing together. Now, I got a whole load of Cosmo modules a few years ago now. And I got as far as building one of the oscillators. It didn't quite work out. I found it quite a challenge because I think this is this is certainly not beginner level DIY. It's, it's, it's another level up. You've got to have your wits about you and, you know, it needs a bit of your time. So I haven't done any more. I mean to, I have meant to, and I've got a whole load of components that I bought for all of these individual modules uh, in order to do that. So I thought when I saw this, heck, I could, I've probably already got the parts. So it felt like a really cool idea. And what I also really liked is the idea of actually turning this in to kind of a four voice synthesizer, by which I mean, you know, a bit like the Oberheim eight voice or the, the two voice uh, thing of that. So this is a synth voice by itself, two oscillators. You could, you could build two of them and run them together or four of them and run them together. And maybe there's an interesting way of doing that. Maybe, there's an interesting way of making your own panels. Maybe I could make a molten customized front panel for it. I don't know. I mean, there's lots and lots of possibilities because this is such an open uh, format. You know, you've got all the stuff here. You've just got to build it. I mean, this, and then you stick your own front panel on. You could build an entire synth in a suitcase, you know. That interests me. Do I have the time for that? No, of course not, but I'll flipping give it a go. <laughs> right. I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to see whether I have the parts for it and then just put the bloody thing together. Why not? Why not do that? That sounds really exciting. I mean, I love what Sam does. I love the whole Cosmo thing. I think it's I think it's brilliant. And it's so good to see him out on tour again. He's going to tour Europe, I think, at the moment, which is brilliant because he came and did uh, the patch off at, uh, at the first Synth East last year. And at the time, he was feeling pretty rough about live performance. He was really down about it. And uh, I'm really... I'm really pleased to see that he's come out the other end of that and is now preparing his big Cosmo touring rig in order to do a proper tour, which is great. So, you know, look after yourself, Sam. Best of luck with all of that. I hope to see you at some point um, if you ever come up this way again and do a bit of tour in this direction. I'd love to see you play. But in the meantime, I'm going to see if I can put this together and I, I promise I won't be a bother about it. 
thought this was quite interesting. Synthcube have acquired Mod Wiggler. Now Synthcube is uh, a big modular and DIY shop in America. It's the place where I bought my entire kit for my Deckard's Dream. And they've sent me a few bits and pieces over the, over the years. And they're great. They do a good job. They serve uh, the synth community really well. I think they offer a great range of products and great support uh, for all those DIYs out there. Mod Wiggler that you may know is one of the largest uh, support and discussion forums for modular synths out there. Uh, they've been through it quite a lot. They've been through it with uh, with the name change that they went through and also with the death of Mike McGrath who was the original founder of the website. Uh, it's about four years ago now. Um, so they've been through some stuff, but the site has been has been great. I love the fact that they changed the name from something which was, you know, very knowing, but ultimately not great in terms of trying to diversify and trying to equalize the uh, the gender disparity that there is in modular synthesis and uh, and this kind of hobby side of things. And so, you know, they awesomely changed their name. Uh, to Mod Wiggler, which has been great. And the website has improved and they've developed it. And I think it's Mike's brother who's been uh, instrumental in getting the site really to a really good place. And the site is vital because it holds um, a huge legacy of conversations, of discussions about everything. Everything in Modular and Eurorack and other formats is also actually the support website for a number of uh, Modular makers and Modular manufacturers who use the site as the place where people can come and ask questions and find out stuff about it. So it's a vital resource for the whole community. So SynthCube is taking it on. How that will change, I don't really know. They're kind of saying it's not really going to change. They're just uh, you know, putting in some, some investment into the infrastructure and looking after it. And I mean, ultimately, it's going to be a useful device for SynthCube to pull in new customers and that kind of thing. And there ain't nothing wrong with that. So I look forward to whatever that develops into, provided that it just, just don't break it. <laughs> break it it's such a great resource uh, and you know i've been um i've been a supporter of uh, of mod wiggler ever since the name change thing came up i'm a patron and invest money in them every month in order to support what they do because i think it is a fantastic resource and i can recommend that you do the same and ultimately my hope is that the forum just keeps on going and keeps on getting better and the synth cube want to bolt things on then then fill your boots, absolutely fill your boots, because I, I have every confidence that they're a, a great outfit, a great company, and it sounds like a good thing going forward. The FACO have three new modules out this week. The first one called Octaves VCO is this fella here, which you can't see just off camera. There it is. It's fabulous. I've done a video on it. Well, only a demo video, a sound demo video. You should go and check that out. Now, I made that video before I had any idea how it was supposed to sound. <laughs> so I hadn't seen anything else on it at the time because I'm, you know, sometimes I get privileged access to things before they're out, which is nice and lovely. So I had a bit of a play with it, made some sounds. I don't know if that's how it's supposed to sound or not, but that's the sound that I made. I kind of expected it to be a little bit more organ-like, but with, because the idea of it is, is that you've got like, how many octaves? Six, six octave sliders. Uh, so it makes all of these octave sounds all at the same time, rather than switching octaves like you might in another oscillator. This generates all six octaves all at once and you can turn them up as much as you like or modulate those in and out in order to add harmonics and overtones and those kinds of feels. And so it's been quite interesting when I made my little video on it that a lot of people have thought that sounds that it sounded really good, which is nice. Because as I say, I don't know, is it supposed to sound like this? I don't know, I just kind of went, I went with it. And then I, I was also rooting that through the Pony VCF, which is the next thing they've got, which I have here also, which you, which you can't see. I've been using that a little bit. It was uh, shown at Synth East um, uh, a month or so ago, and I've been using it a little bit. And what I like about it is that it's got three inputs with mixing, and it sounds nice and it's compact. I mean, that and a Pony VCO is a phenomenal little combination of a great sounding oscillator. I use the Pony VCO all the time. It's, it's a constant oscillator in my system now and it's beautifully small. And the Pony VCF is beautifully small also. It sits alongside it. Lovely, and you can poke a different couple of different things in it, which is really nice. It also has a inbuilt VCA, so you can run an envelope directly into it as in an envelope to control the cutoff and then an envelope to control 
the sound, which is which is nice. It saves you from having to have a VCA somewhere else if, if again, you're looking for a very compact system. I think that works very well. There is something about feedback on the third channel which I don't quite un understand. I haven't looked into that yet. <laughs> Uh, the third module is the MIDI thing, which is a reworked version of their original MIDI thing, which is essentially a MIDI to CV converter. Plug MIDI in the top, all of these CVs come out the other end. It's uh, accessible from a web browser, so you can configure it to output whether it's notes or modulation or you know, velocity, aftertouch, whatever it is you want to feed in and feed out, you can then stuff all that into your modular system. It's, it's great. There's a couple of really good MIDI to CV um, modules out now. The other one from Hex Inverter, the Mutant Brain could be, can't remember. But this one looks equally uh, as interesting. And with the display, I think it's going to give you a lot of hands-on information which you don't get perhaps in other modules. Uh, next up we have, well, it's another module from Perfaco, but this is designed by DivKit. And that's the output bus. Oh yes, what is it? It's a mixer without mixing. It's a summing mixer. It's a stereo mixer of which you've got one, two, three, four, five, six channels of stereo input into here, uh, which is then summed together beautifully uh, through a number of different outputs, including a Eurorack output, which I think is vitally important. It's very compact, it's nice, and it solves a number of problems because you're often mixing in different places within your within your Euroracks, you've already got levels kind of sorted out. And this brings them together, rather than having to go from a mixer to another mixer, because mixers tend to be large. Or if you're using little mixers, they tend to only be able to handle a couple of different channels. So you've got these different things going on. Like for instance, my um, my motion meter makes for a great mixer, but it's only a three sources mixing to a, a single output, which you could then plug into here to combine with other ones which are knocking around doing other bits of mixing. The other thing you could do is pair it up with a stereo strip like that. So then this actually acts as a mixer before this. So you can end up with a six channel uh, stereo mixer using these stereo uh, strips in order to give you CV control over panning and interesting bits and pieces, mute switches and level and stuff. So it can create quite an intense mixer situation that's very, very modular, could be all over the place and can build up over time. It's also really good for things like polyphony because I've, I'm at the moment I'm working on some videos that are using multiple oscillators or multiple voices, which could very easily be brought together into something like this, particularly because it has a Eurorack output. So it's not just an output module. It's not just giving you line level output, or headphone output, it's also got Eurorack. So I can put a whole bunch of voices into here and then process it through the rest of my system to another output. So nicely, nicely versatile. It also has a line level input on the, the bottom one or rather switchable between line and synth input. So you could bring in something from outside, sneak it in to here. I mean, this is particularly good because so many things are stereo now. You've got stereo filters, stereo effects, and all of them would benefit from something like this that just brings the whole lot together. The Von Gon Replay. Now this has the potential to be quite hilarious. <laughs> is it hilarious? Is it funny? Is it serious? Is it awesome? These are questions that get thrown up when you look at this thing. Is it a toy? Is it, or is it something else? Is it is it more professional than we could possibly imagine? See, the thing with Von Gon is that they make fantastic pedals. Not only do they make fantastic pedals, but they make fantastic videos about fantastic pedals. I mean, their videos are second to none. I love it, all the animation and stuff that's inside. They really open up and explain things in such a visually awesome way. There's nothing else quite like it. And they've brought that sense of, of charm, that sense of uh, fun and playfulness to a flipping synthesizer that's called Replay. Doesn't look much like a synthesizer. I'm not sure what it looks like, to be honest. But apparently it's inspired by things like Juno synthesizers um, and that kind of that kind of stuff. I mean, so that's, that's quite ambitious. It's not a small, a small idea. But I think what we find, as far as I can understand from within this thing, is that we have a virtual analog synthesizer that's based upon a good, great sounding polyphonic synthesis. 
And so what you get in this bizarre looking machine, <laughs> I mean, I could call it a keyboard, but I don't know whether I really want to yet, is you get you get the basics out the front. So you've got some, some tuning, you've got filter, you've got envelope, you've got modulation, and it's all there and you can play your notes. How many notes is it? Six notes, six notes, virtual analog polyphony. And you can enjoy it as a very a very hands-on surface level polyphonic good sounding that that synthesizer sound synthesizer thing <laughs> what am I, saying? I don't really know i think i'm distracted by the keys to be honest it's hard not to be distracted by the keys because what they are is is qwerty keyboard keys they are clackety clickety clackety mechanical keyboard keys which are as noisy as heck and not exactly expressive you know those keys are not known for levels of velocity and that kind of thing it's not it's switching on and off very much and i mean it all takes some getting used to let's let's say that it, they've decided to not go for a traditional keyboard because that would be crazy that would be that would be not quite deeply boutique -y, creative and artistic enough they have to go for something slightly weird just to to give you a different approach to kick you out of your comfort zone and to make you think about what it is that you're you're trying to achieve and giving you a clickety clackety experience <laughs> I was really excited when I heard that Von Gon were going to do a synth. And I don't know how to feel about it. Now, Emily Hopkins did a video on this, which I thought was, was great and very, very revealing. And it sounded all right, you know. It, it sounds it sounds cool. And certainly when you, you pair it up with other Von Gon effects, which are extraordinary, then you have quite an exciting synthesizer time. I just don't know whether the synth itself really is exciting enough by itself i mean it is interesting it's quirky it sounds all right it has an arpeggiator would you believe in fact it's a it's a sort of arpeggiator that you also get on the the tiger keyboard which i'm going to speak about in a moment and it has this very sort of simple way of either doing classic arps or you can build up an arp by adding notes to a cyclic idea i think <laughs> <laughs> the other thing about it is you can't read any of the writing. There is writing on it, apparently, but who knows where or in what sort of colour. Maybe it only shines up under ultraviolet light or, or something. Maybe you've got to wear a special pair of glasses in order to see it. Who knows? But, you know, the labelling of controls generally just gets in the way, doesn't it? It gets in the way of your, of your ability to emote through the, the random connection and movement of sliders and knobs and stuff. I don't know. I don't know what to think. I don't know what to think. You know, it's eight hundred ninety-nine dollars, which is not massively expensive for a polyphonic synth. You know, it's kind of in the the region of the Dreadbox Nymphus. But does it offer more than that? The fact that it has a keyboard, or are you ultimately going to be plugging in a MIDI keyboard anyway? Really, aren't you? Are you? Aren't you? I mean, it has hidden levels apparently, like the Nymphus does, and there's also a web app. Uh, with which you can connect to it and get to all of the controls and bits and pieces. So there's probably a lot of scope for deeper, more interesting editing in there if you can get if you can get down to that. But as it is, I mean it's a fascinating experiment in in hipsterness and you know awesome instrument building and design because it's it's different. It knocks you a little bit sideways, and there's no reason why we can't have disruption in this industry it's a it's a good and positive thing will it fly i don't know i don't know i mean i do love those effects though the, the polyphrase i think is the most uh, exciting and extraordinary <laughs> stereo effect that i've ever seen i would love to have one sometime one day i'll get around to it and so maybe there's just Maybe there's just more to the replay than, than meets the eye. Maybe once it's in your hands and you're exploring it, that it really gives. I don't know. We shall see. Ayo, Dio Instruments. I don't know how to, to how to pronounce it, but they have this thing called Loom. It's another one of these these brilliant attempts at trying to trying to tackle the idea 
of a creative controller that can take full advantage of what MPE offers us. Multipolyphonic expression, it's the thing that Roly have done really well with their squishy keyboards. It allows you to, to play notes, then push into them to do some kind of timbre change and then pitch up and down as you slide about and every note is an individual thing. Now, Iodio, Iodio have tackled this with, with a, in a wooden way with their instrument that's called Loom. And it's it's really quite beautiful. Now you may know this company from, they did this control blowing controller, they did this uh, physical modeling synth called the uh, Anamophy. I'm not really doing very well with these names. But by the by, what they have now is this, this Loom MPE controller. And really the demos, the demos are quite nice, quite enticing. I mean, we've had so many goes at this. So many people do a Kickstarter of a new controller that's apparently gonna let us connect with our instruments even better than we ever have before. But I do find that we tend to all just return to the keyboard because how much expression do you really need to put in things? You know, aren't you modulating that in? Aren't you LFOing that in? Aren't you adding that in post? Or, you know, is it in that actual moment of performance? Do we need to have more to think about than just actually making those notes happen in a way that's interesting? You know, maybe I, maybe I, sometimes I think we're just asking too much of ourselves or assuming that, that this is what we want. I don't know. I think sometimes music is simpler than this. But anyway, what do we have? We've got a little strip of wood, a little strip of veneer that you can tap and push and make notes on. It's got like a, a keyboard representation above the top so you know where the notes are. Um, and you can strum it as well as, as well as play it and play drums on it. There's lots of different modes for, for melody and for chords and bits and pieces. Also something that's quite interesting is that because it's quite it's quite small and compact, you can you can sort of stick your thumb over the side, you've got another strip of expressionness on the sides that you can add to it. So you stick your fingers on it, you push forward, or you slide, and you generate all of this MIDI data to control your instruments. I mean obviously it's going to depend largely on what instruments you're plugging it into, but ultimately it offers the opportunity for creative and expressive control over those instruments. I get a little bit alarmed when people start picking them up and try to sort of play it like this. It's like, no, 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 don't do that. Just put it on your desktop. It's fine on the desktop. Leave it there. Let's not start getting silly now. And you, then you can play it and press into it and do all those sorts of things that you want to do. So the loom, multi-dimensional sort of a wooden veneer thing. Oh yeah, it's got another active pad on it. Does it say active something? It's got another button. <laughs> so there's no end. Not only are you, you you're putting all of your, your, your emotional sweat into this finger thing over here, you've also got your thumb thing you're trying to move. Then with another finger, you're trying to get that into that active nodule thing over here all at the same time in order to create this extraordinary expressive performance. Some of these things are lost on me, I, I think. Now, Noise Engineering have produced one of the most easy to pronounce modules ever called the OpNed. OpNed. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe it should be something. Maybe it's OPNeedy. I don't know. Anyway, what is it? It's an ARP. It's an ARP. I think it makes things go up, makes things go down. But what's kind of nice about it is that it's four channels and you can modulate exactly how those patterns are are relating and moving and changing and, and modulating. It comes with 12 arpeggiation patterns already built in and you can of course customize those and save those to your own set of presets. You can use CV to change the pattern, to change the direction. You can use it to transpose all four arps at once. And while all four channels use the same arpeggiation, they have individual trigger input, so you can you can have them running essentially at different speeds depending on how you are triggering them. So same bunch of notes, but four channels revolving around those notes, which makes that quite interesting. It has the has the ability to generate a lot of, of of interesting sequences, which are all based on the same bunch of notes. So you've got something which is all relative to each other, just running at different times, and then transposing it using another sequencer, or maybe you could probably transpose it with itself. Probably. By, by running a slow one, taking that out and putting that back in again. That's gotta be possible, hasn't it? That sounds like the sort of thing you'd do in your Iraq. 
Third Modular released The Tiger just after I'd released the other Molten Monthly, which is, oh yeah, they're so frustrating when they do that. But anyway, so we've had a whole month to enjoy uh, The Tiger Keyboard. It's great. It feels to me like, I mean, I've done an entire an entire video review of the thing, so go and check that out. I go into all the detail about what's fabulous about it. But I think my overall too long didn't read impression is that it feels like a real synthesizer and by that I mean you have an instrument which is which is which is complete and very satisfying you know the keyboard connects very well to everything that's going on it's baked in it feels like it's there and then the way that you approach it as a synthesizer you've got these three oscillators which you're not immediately smashing into each other because I think when it's when it's an individual desktop unit or in Eurorack you tend to just mess everything about everything is on everything is going everywhere but if you take the keyboard concept because it's very much like a mini Moog it absolutely has that vibe about it three oscillators you know a filter mixing dynamics it's got all of that basic sort of stuff and so rather than having everything running into everything, you would just take a single oscillator and play with that and enjoy that running through the filter. And you've got all of the wave warping and wave folding in order to generate all these different sort of tones that you wouldn't get on a regular subtractive synthesizer. So it has a lot of scope, a lot of variation, but simply turning it into a keyboard instrument brings it a whole other level, I think. And of course the expansion of the knobs, the fact that everything is large, everything is nicely laid out, you can really get to it rather than fiddling about as we were a little bit in the original Tiger. It's it's just a really nice synthesizer now. Yeah, monophonic, duophonic, kind of sort of almost paraphonically so, but of course it also has this little bay for you rack in the side. Now I'm, I'm, I blow hot and cold on that. I mean, I think the fact that it doesn't have great effects particularly in this thing. It does have an echo, which is all right in certain circumstances, but not brilliantly so. And so having this Eurorack bay means you can drop in a fabulous reverb or some other form of modulation. And that's really great. I don't know that it's the killer feature that that perhaps we might think it is on, on first view, because you're it, just ending up filling up holes. <laughs> with things that it doesn't have but actually it has pretty much everything so there's not a whole lot you need to put in there except perhaps a decent reverb or I mean, maybe a sequencer the thing with a sequencer is that you can't sequence the entire synth the synth works via midi you can only sequence individual oscillators which is interesting by itself but that's just a a thing to think about so I'm not entirely certain whether the Eurac Bay is as awesome, perhaps, as we think it might be initially. But hey, it's innovative, it's a great idea, it's not taking anything away from it, it gives you an opportunity to add more to it and to expand it, and that is certainly interesting. So as a synthesizer by itself, though, as an instrument, I think it's fabulous. And it's going to stick around a great deal. It's going to, it's going to find its way onto here, so that it's going to be always accessible. The Metal Fetishist from Body Synths is a crazy, glitchy, noise, percussion, drummy type, triggery machine. It's all about plucky microtonal messing arounds and explosive digital glitches. It can do drones, it can do noise, it can do nasty, nasty distortion. <laughs> Sorry about the cockerel. It has a pair of random generators in order to... to push everything about to start generating to start clashing with your triggers to start creating uh, these micro flips over here and these digital scratches over there and you have a modulation section which can start wanging the filter about can start really pulling uh, different forms of dynamics and different bits of expression out of itself and in through itself you could see it as a pattern generator. You could see it as a percussion line inventor. You could see it as something which can generate different rhythms over time that you can work on and groove into and pull different ideas from. It sounds completely mad. <laughs> it's not quite available yet. Apparently it's going to be released in the spring, which should be any time now. But maybe, hopefully, we'll see them at Superbooth. 
running into a bit of software now is Visco from Forever 89. I'm not sure if that's 1989. I'm not sure why that was important. 1989 was quite of a big year for me, I seem to remember. But is that anything to do with this? Who can tell? So this appears to be a sample modeling drum machine, but one that's presented in the form of some kind of globular mass that's pulsating and emanating on your screen. It's just fascinating. What is going on with all that? What is it representing exactly? I mean, I don't know that I care what it's representing because it's it's fabulous. But my assumption is that it's that you're seeing some kind of frequency spectrum, and it's that that this globule bubble of globiness is globbing its way into. <laughs> it's kind of a sequencer pattern generator. You can run all sorts of different sounds from it and then morph those sounds through the blob into each other. I think the idea is that it's a manipulator or rather the, the blob encourages you to manipulate, it encourages you to push it about, to squeeze it, to manipulate it and malleable it. <laughs> It's just fascinating to watch, I have to say. I mean, the sounds, sounds are great. I mean, it's obviously gonna depend a little bit on what sort of samples you're throwing in there. But the result through its its multi-channel sequencing is, is pretty great. Pretty fun, I think. There's a lot of shaping. There's eight tracks to play with. There's 32 voices in which to get yourself messed up about in i suppose it's a ton of variations lots of effects and stuff you can run it through all of it being step sequenced to the extreme visco yeah visco i like that quite that's quite good isn't it? like viscous it's this feeling it has a tangibleness to it you just want to kind of reach out and and squash it Kind of less extraordinary, but something that I thought was really interesting is the Roland RD-08. Now the RD range of pianos has been around for donkey's years. I used to sell RD pianos back in the days of turnkey, you know, at the turn of the millennium. <laughs> so this idea, this stage piano of Roland's has been around forever, really, I think. And this feels like an interesting development. Uh, the RD-08, the idea is that it gives you that whole 88 keyed, uh, heavy weighted, superb piano sound. But in something which is a little bit more lightweight, something which you can actually take to gigs without killing yourself and breaking your own back. But not only that, it also has an absolute shed load of sounds inside. So you, while you've got your supernatural acoustic and electric piano, so you've got you know, the, the two big sounds, if you like, that come with the RD piano, You've also got, I think, an organ and some strings or something. But then you've got 3000 Zencore sounds. It has the entire Zencore engine inside and it's expandable with wave expansions and all sorts of stuff. So from this very unassuming looking stage piano, where well, you've got your piano and strings, you've got your electric piano, oh yeah, la -di -la -di -la, that's fine on stage. But then <laughs> through a push of a button, you've got access to every sound that ever was. It could be a Jupiter 8, it could be a Juno, it could be a Phantom, it could be, you know, whatever sound it is that you'd like Roland to produce for you, you can stick it inside. And that, that just makes it, I think, quite extraordinary. I mean, maybe they've done this before and I just haven't noticed. Oh, probably. But for something which is, which is compact and could realistically be the sort of piano you could use, uh, you know, in church or in a club uh, or at your little gigs, it just has this massive sound engine, which I think is great. And it's, it's unfettered by complicated menus or uh, a, you know, a huge raft of knobs. You've just got four knobs, I think it is, and a couple of buttons. So it's not there for you to program synths on. It's just there for you to enjoy the sound of layering up. I think you can layer your three tones together. So with your piano, you add a couple of synths underneath, you know, or whatever, or to split it across different things. So. I think that's that's a, a shrewd, useful, helpful, practical piano from Roland, the RD-08. New in from Busy Circuits, or ALM, is the Sizzle. Great name. Great name for a module. It's based around or inspired by or somehow connected to the Casio CZ synthesizer, which we all loved and we all no longer have access to and are forever talking about, oh, I wish someone would make a CZ synth again. Well, here we are. Here it is in the shape of a VCO for your Eurorack. 
It is a dual digital phase distortion VCO. It has a primary and secondary oscillator for layering and detuning. It has extendable and morphable phase distortion wave generation algorithms and unique resonance wave generation. What, what does it all mean? <laughs> it has built-in VCA in various controls. I never really understood what a CZ synthesizer did. I mean, I, I played with the 101 a lot uh, in Cook's Music in Norwich many, many years ago. And they had the CZ5000, which was the one that had the sequencer inside, I think. And that fascinated me, absolutely fascinated me. To the point that there was no way I could afford any of that, but I did end up with this weird little Casio sequencer that Anyway, it doesn't really matter. What we do have is this dual phase distortion VCO called Sizzle from ALM. Now I confess that I find it hard to get excited about Ableton anymore. <laughs> it used to be, used to be the most exciting thing. And of course it, it is, it is absolutely thrilling and exciting. It's a whole world and universe in which you can, you can dive and enjoy uh, every single aspect and device of it. I will get into it at some point, I'm sure. I just, I don't have any desire to, perhaps. Because I know Ableton, you know, pretty well these days, and I'm happy with it. What is it they're gonna do? Should we have a quick look? I mean, I think a lot of the new stuff comes from all of that Max for Live rigmarole that's been going on inside it for ages. I mean, people are extraordinarily creative. You can program amazing devices that control and manipulate stuff within Ableton, which is, I think, as its massive strength is the is the open nature of its ability to manipulate, and that will always be what what really drives it, I think. And with the the new version, you've got sort of the ability to reshape MIDI patterns. You've got generative stuff built in. They've done some work on the MIDI to make it more scalable, or to at least to quantize it better in certain directions, as well as giving it every sort of tuning you can possibly imagine. It has a new MPE synthesizer built in, and so is opening itself up to far more um, expressive recording. And it has a whole bunch of new plugins, no doubt. And is that what we want? Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I guess it, it probably is. So you know what, I'm gonna stop talking about it because I obviously have no clue as to what any of this is about. So anyway, back in the world that I currently understand a little bit more of Eurorack, we have a whole bunch of modules from AM Synths. Now AM Synths make all sorts of kind of tributes to replicas of emulations of uh, classic modules. At the moment, it's got a whole bunch of modules coming out based upon the Roland uh, System 100 modules, or at least inspired by them to one degree or another. These include the AM8111111, VCO and VCF, oscillator and filter smashed together in glorious Rolandness. They have the 8133 dual VCA, the 8131 audio mixer, and the 8171 sequential switch. There's always great stuff coming out from AM Synth. They cover a lot of the synthesizer building blocks with the VCOs and VCFs and VCAs, all the usual sort of stuff, but they also replicate the, the more interesting stuff, the, the sequential switches, the mixers, the, the modulators, and other bits and pieces that you find in these old Roland systems. I am hoping to get my hands on one of their kits fairly soon so I can get a better, a better deeper look at exactly what the AM Synth vibe is all about. And finally, I want to highlight some modules from companies I've not come across before as I'm just searching around on things like Modular Grid, and these looked really interesting. The first lot is from Omnitone. I think these operate out of Canada. And they've got the Melody, the Quadar, Quadar, and the Seven Path. Now, the Melody is quite an interesting melody generator. It's semi-random, so not completely random. It's based on some kind of seeded idea of melody and generational patterns. The concept is that it's based on mood. So whatever you're feeling, really, you can dial that in and it'll generate melodies that'll, that'll reflect your mood. I don't think it does that automatically. I think you have to actually tell it what your mood is, which would think, I mean, if you're thinking about doing a Mark II, you need to put in kind of a mood sensor so it can then just just respond, probably through artificial intelligence, to whatever it is that you're thinking and feeling at that time. But that's not quite what we have here. What we have here is the melody. 
And within this little control panel, you've got ideas like skip in order to set the probability of the next note occurring or happening or moving to the next one. You've got pluck, which deals with its gait, fatness, its width, its length, how long that note is held. You've got tie, which obviously ties notes together in a more of a tied kind of traditional fashion. But then you've got trend, which is interesting. Are you dialing in ideas on, on fashion and cultural representation? Or is it perhaps just pushing things trending towards being up or it's pushing a trend towards it being down? I don't know, it's a nice idea. And then you've got usual things like scale and range and length and that kind of stuff. It's It looks like fun, to be honest. I mean, I, I can always do with a little bit of uh, melody generation. I mean, that's essentially what I use. I use a Turing machine to generate melody. I use eight step sequences to read a darling quick melody. So I'm absolutely into the idea of melodies being generated just on a few ideas and a few twists, and then to modulate and interact with that. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly into that kind of thing. The Quadar then is a four channel AR envelope or slew limiter, apparently. This has got me slightly confused. I mean, it's a four channel envelope, I get that, but it has an in and an out. Am I putting audio through that? Or is that CV control over the AR? Or is the in trigger and the out the output of the envelope? Because that's what I'm going to have to assume it is. It just could be a little bit clearer. And reading the website doesn't seem to really reveal exactly what that is. But we're going to have to make an assumption because Eurorack generally works in the same way. And so I think you trigger on the in and then the out gives you the shape defined by your two knobs. <laughs> I think that's it. Why are these things complicated? It doesn't have to be complicated. Or maybe it's something different to that. Maybe it does have a VCA built in and it's 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 actually doing that that part. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, it's very nice and compact, which is good to get four envelopes out of a module that big. It's pretty good going, I think. And honestly, AR is really all you need, isn't it? Isn't it? And lastly, is a seven path, which is a, a neat idea. We've seen this about a few other companies do this sort of thing. It's just a simple module that's got a network socket at the top and you get two of them, you get a pair, you stick one in one case, one in another, connect them with the network cable. And then each one has seven patch sockets for ins and outs. It could probably take lots more than that, but that's how many you can fit on that particular module. And it's a great way for routing signals from one case to another without having to drag great big long cables about the place. So great, useful and handy. So there you go, that's Omnitone. The other bunch of weirdo modules is from Ear Modular. These are, I don't know what to say about this. I mean, they're evidently from, I mean, Japan, I'm gonna say possibly, I would say, and the translation into English on on a modular grid is is just is pretty awesome. I have to say, the first module is called Trot. Now, Trot is an ultrasound filter. It's not fully explained exactly what that is, but I think it's two filters operating together, where the cutoffs, although independently changeable, also affect each other in some kind of strange way. And sort of you're reading through this, going, oh, this sounds interesting and then you get to the demo video which is just like a wall of sound and noise coming at you and you go right right I, I'm no I'm no clearer but what I really like is at the end it has this tip which kind of sums up the entire module it says trot can also be used for filtering the filtering will have distortion and the sound is very special yeah <laughs> I think that's probably about right. The other module is called Hadouken. Isn't that what what's it says in Street Fighter? Hadouken. I think it might be something to do with that. But this is a Xena tube breakdown noise generator with an arcade button. So it generates noise. So again, video wall of noise. But this one has an arcade button where so you can sort of like turn it on and off, or you can tap it to make it happen. So you can use it as a noise source, obviously but you can also use it as a percussion source using that button or by triggering it or some other kind of kind of messing about. Front panels on these are great. They look like fantastic modules, even if they are generally just creating a massive load of noise. But what you have to understand really is that is I'm not really into noise in that sort of way. I'm, I appreciate it and I, I appreciate that, that people are. So things like the, the metal fetishist that we had earlier and these two modules, this, this glitchy, noisy kind of crazy stuff. I understand that people like it and I appreciate that and I want to celebrate and encourage and support your desire to enjoy this kind of thing. 
but it's just it's difficult for me to get enthusiastic about it because it's just like it's just like noise isn't it <laughs> but great so that's ear modular yeah not come across them before and you'll find them also on modular grid so there we are that'll do that'll do i think that's plenty that's plenty to chew on this month i think what do we have coming up well i've i'm embarking on some strange adventure into the disting <laughs> i don't know i don't know how i've agreed to do this but somehow somehow oz uh, expert sleepers has persuaded me into the idea of doing some 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 work some videos on on the disting because the disting is a strange but awesome digital module that's packed full of really useful algorithms and it's something which i really really struggle to like so much so that they've sent me the the extra large one here which is boggling my mind totally totally boggling my mind but what i've agreed to do is accept the challenge of working out what I like about the disting because there are things to like there are definitely things to like it's been enormously helpful in my Eurorack journey and there's stuff in there which can be immensely useful to people it's a phenomenal module it's just that there's there's a barrier between a person like myself who likes to twiddle knobs and understanding and getting into what the disting can offer so my plan is just to tackle it head on, to have a look, to give it a go, to find out what I can pull out of the thing. And then I'm going to have uh, do a live stream interview with, uh, with Andrew Ostler or Oz from Expert Sleepers. And we're just going to talk through it and see if he can show me the way. And then hopefully after that, I'll do another video of, of what I've discovered and what I've found since then. So that's, that's the plan. That's coming up in April, some point over the next few weeks it's obviously there's easter holidays now so that's getting in the way i would also like to point out that i've done a shed load of videos this month i feel completely rejuvenated having left left gear news behind it's given me uh, a new focus and time in order to really pump out some some interesting stuff and it's great and i'm actually getting through some of the backlog which also feels very exciting and we've got got jet aircraft over the top of us now that's that's nice but I'm going to keep plugging away at these videos because that's uh, I'm, finding it, I'm finding it immensely awesome at the moment <laughs> to be making this many videos it's brilliant so I'm going to keep that going I have one last thing to talk about and that's Patreon oh no Patreon oh yeah bloody Patreon yeah join my Patreon subscribe and like and share and all those sorts of things yeah yeah I know I get it right it drives me nuts too however Patreon is a really useful resource for someone like myself who, I mean, I'm nearly at 50,000 subscribers. Very nearly. I'm weeks away from 50,000, which seems amazing. But I've been doing this YouTube thing for a long time. And it still doesn't pay for itself. It still doesn't. And yet they've put in more and more adverts so that you have to sit through more and more adverts to watch the content that you want to watch. And it's... It's frustrating, I think, for a creator like myself who just keeps keeps pumping that stuff out there and we just don't seem to be getting ahead, don't seem to be getting more views, just still getting the same sort of views every time. And that slow, slow climb of subscribers. And it's not as if the platform is really rewarding us uh, for all the effort either. And so I was recently inspired by some videos by Jade Wee, who's a, someone that I met at Tome and Synth Reactor a few years ago, who's a great creator. She does videos on all sorts of, uh, of, of stuff, bits of hardware, synths, uh, bits and pieces, talking about music. She does the synth shows. She's great. Uh, I think she does a, a fabulous job. And she's gone through a similar uh, journey to me. She has a similar amount of um, subscribers, a similar income, and has just sort of decided to focus much more on Patreon rather than YouTube. Because YouTube as a platform, she's decided, is just not not going to get her anywhere. It's not going to help. And you feel like you're flogging your guts out to try to meet the, the metrics and to do something interesting with the algorithm. Whereas, actually, if you make content for people who want your content, then Patreon is a much better platform for it. And you can sign up for free. You don't have to pay money. You can go there and follow myself or someone like Jade for, for free and you'll get notified every time they upload something to it. Now, you're not always going to see all the content for free because there are tiers to it so that 
if you actually want to support a creator, you can give them some money and that will give you access to more stuff. So I've been thinking about this and I think it's a really positive way forward is to try to do more on the Patreon side of things, to give you, the viewer, an opportunity to support me more directly or just to go onto an ad-free platform which isn't messing you about or distracting you from your entire day like YouTube is. So you can go to my Patreon page, you can join up for free and I will start putting stuff on there for free free stuff not everything if you really want to access everything ad free which is what it will be so no youtube ads no interruptions no sitting through five minutes of some rubbish before you actually get to your content you can get to it directly you just got to give us a couple of quid a month that's it or it's like it's like the cheapest subscription you'll get anywhere and you'll get all of my videos all of my content absolutely without adverts and you'll also get access to my discord server where we can chat and talk about anything that you want and there'll also be exclusive content on there which will include things like i'll pull out all the sound demos that i do in a review video so you've just got the sounds that you can go and listen to in a single video without any adverts and i'll come up and think up with other stuff as well we'll see we'll develop it but hopefully it's a much nicer more useful experience than what youtube is offering which is just getting less and less useful. I will still undoubtedly publish to YouTube because that's where I can reach new people more obviously. So I'll continue to do that. But if you want things ad free, you want more content and interesting stuff, come and join us on Patreon. So there we go, that'll do. Oh, live stream. Should we try this Sunday? Now this Sunday is Easter day as it happens, but I think I might be able to get away with doing an evening live stream. Eight o'clock, we can come and talk about all this sort of stuff. That would be great. Come along. Join in. It's quite good fun. Uh, bring some alcohol. That always helps. And if you're able to come along to the Rack launch party in Bristol next week on the 4th of April, I'll be there. Come and say hello. That would be great. I hope that's useful. In the meantime, go and make some tunes.